Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I encourage you to take your seats? Um, we've got an action-packed set of union lectures this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Rikia Babamaji as the first of this morning's union lecturers. Rikia is Deputy Director, Strategic Space Applications Department of the National Space Research and Development Agency, Nigeria. Her expertise is in geology, water resources applications, environmental assessment, remote sensing, and geographical information systems. She gained a BTEC in geology from the Federal University of Technology, Yola, Adamawa, Nigeria, MSCs in environmental resources management from Lagos State University, Nigeria, and in space management from the International Space University, Strasbourg, France. And her doctorate was in geosciences and civil engineering, awarded by the University of Missouri, Kansas City, USA. Alongside her current role, she has a visiting lecturer appointment at the Institute of Space Science Engineering, African Union of Science Technolo and Technology in Abuja, Nigeria. She is the Vice Chair of the African Union Science and Technology Advisory Group on Disaster Risk Reduction, one of two African scientists recently invited onto the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Global Risk Assessment Framework Steering Group, and a vice chair of ITU WMO UNEP focal group on artificial intelligence for natural disaster management. She is involved at high level in several large Nigerian projects on agriculture, land use, demographics, and infrastructure, and her previous research has used geospatial techniques in topics such as local climate variability and spatiotemporal trends in Lassa fever and primary health facilities. Thus, you can see that her research is truly interdisciplinary and strongly aligned with the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development, topics that are close to my heart. Rakia, I invite you to give your union lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Kati, and thank you all. It is my honor to be here. This is my first time, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, present something that uh, is dear to my heart, the lecture basin. Uh, as mentioned by Professor Kati, I am from Nigerian Space Agency, uh, the head of Natural Resources Management Division, and uh, we do a lot of research uh, towards sustainable development uh, goals. So this research is toward also uh, one of the sustainable development goals, that's goal C. And um, I have other colleagues that are part of this research, and you can see their name. Um, I would also like to say thank you to Monique because she was the first person to invite me to another uh, lecture that I did on Thursday on land productivity in lecture basing uh, for section of AI for natural disaster uh, management. Thank you. As mentioned, I'm from Nigerian Space Agency and Nigerian Space Agency is National Space Research and Development Agency. Uh, and is, it, it, Nigerian Space Agency was established in 1999. Um, it has the mandate to uh, conduct research, uh, capacity building, engineering development, design and appropriate hardware and software in space technology. Uh, so that is the building the front of our office, when you are coming into Abuja from airport, you will see it. Nigerian Space Agency has six satellites in space. Uh, Nigerian Sat-1, Nigerian Sat-2, Nigerian Sat-X, uh, Nigerian 
NICOMSAT 1, that's communication satellite, NICOMSAT 2. So the Nigerian SAT 1 is the orbited, but we have the data in archive. And uh, Nigerian SAT 2 is 2.5 and 5 meter, while Nigerian SAT X is 22 meter. And Nigerian SAT 1 is 32 meter resolution. So, why NASDA is in Lake Chad? Like I mentioned before, NASDA is responsible for using satellite technology to help with sustainable development of Nigeria. So, Nigeria, as part of Lake Chad Basin, uh, and there's a problem of uh, environmental problem due to climate change, human in, you know, interaction, uh, which is deemed fit for us also as an institute in Nigeria to conduct uh, research in Lake Chad. So, and why space? Lake Chad is a very big area. It covers a large landmass. So I, from this space, will be the best, especially now that it's inaccessible as because of insurgency and um, that's why we were using space, and it is even cost-effective and uh, less time-consuming. You can see some of the satellite uh, images of Lake Chad. This is from NASA, and then we have this from uh, Nigeria, when we had a research uh, trip before the insurgency to install some ground monitoring equipment sponsored by NASA and NSF. What is the objective of this project? The aim is to monitor special temperature changes in Lake Chad Basin using geospatial techniques. Um, the study is critical in understanding dynamic of the lake ecosystem and hydrology uh, supporting evidence-based decision to, to ensure sust its sustainable management. We have done several research in, in this area, right from 80s. I know the write-up is a little too small. Uh, we have done assessment of change in area extent. We have done feasibility study. We have done uh, a field trip organized by the Techn um, Directorate of Technical Cooperation in Africa. We have done groundwater assessment of part of Nigerian aspect of Lake Chad. Uh, we have collaborated with NASA using Giovanni to investigate the link between environmental process and drought. Uh, we did seasonal hydrologic feedback also. And we have collaborated with different organizations from NASA, National Science Foundation, some university within the country, the Lake Chad Basin Commission, and the other university around or within the basin. And some of these are some of the results from those uh, researches that we have conducted with different organizations. Now, Lake Chad Basin. When you hear Lake Chad Basin, you are wondering how many countries are sharing it. We have the conventional Lake Chad Basin. It is shared by eight countries. Uh, that includes uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, Algeria, Libya, and so on. And then we have the lake itself. It's shared by only four countries. Um, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. It is the largest closed basin on Earth, covering 2.5 million kilometers, about 8% of total Africa landmass. Uh, about 60 of these basins lie on the southern, uh, south edge of the Sahara Desert. The, the humidity is relatively high. Uh, almost 60% of population in the basin are in part of Nigeria. So that's why the interest of us doing research in the area. The hydrological condition of the basin, 
There are two uh, major rivers discharging into the lake. One is from Nigeria and one is from uh, uh, the uh, Congo uh, Republic. The Chari Lagone River, which runs from Congo Republic into the lake, contributes um, 95 percent. Then Komadugu Yorbe River from Nigeria, 3 percent. And then the precipitation is 2 percent. Uh, but the problem is that most of these rivers are dammed, especially from Nigeria. The one running from Nigeria has almost three to four dams, big dams, and so almost nothing is reaching the, the lake. And as well, even in the Chari Lagone River, a lot of modifications, and also coupled with the fact that that is the area where uh, the lecture building commissions and some of its partners are trying to do water transfer into the lake in order to stabilize the lake itself. Some of the problems facing the lake or in the basin, um, most of researchers say it's climate change. Some say it's human interference, but it's both climate change and human interference. Uh, you can see sedimentation, uh, you can see hotspot for conflicts, overgrazing, water hyacinth, drought and desertification. All this problem happens in Lake Chad Basin. So that's why there's so much interest in saving the lake so that um, the people in that area can um, at least go on with their life or have a livelihood to depend on. For this research, we use different data from different sources. Um, you can see we have, we use Landsat's over 125 scenes covering the area that tell you how large is Lake Chad. And then because of the volume of data, we have to end up switch to Google Earth Engine so that we can reduce the processing time and have access to more data in order to fill the gap. Uh, so most of, often when you are working in Africa, so particularly in Nigeria, with a large volume of data, it takes time for you to process, process those data. So sometimes we have to find our way out to, to reduce the processing time. Before now, if you, the last slide I show is about some of the various researches that we have conducted right from 80s, you know, up to. But then we need a recent information about the area. Since insurgency doesn't allow most people to be uh, doing research on the ground, so we thought, okay, why don't we do 2022? We do quarterly and see the changes. So this is the result of the first uh, work we did on this partial temporal monitoring. So we have water body, forest, BLN, and grassland. We want to see changes in between. So if you look at the result, you can see the different changes. January, um, April, July, and October. And in this area, rainfall is during July, mostly July, October period. So if you look at January, uh, the greenish indicator of NDVI, you know, very high vegetation area, is less. And if you come to October, you can see there's a lot of green color in that area, which represents more vegetation. It means a lot of rainfall and vegetation mimic uh, the rain pattern. Also, you, you can see from the, the graph here, most of the rainfall is between, like I said, June, July, and October. So that's why you see a lot of vegetation. 
So then we switch and say, okay, let's do it for longer period. And then we choose to do from 2012 to 2022. <clears throat> and this is the result for that. You can see the fluctuation in water surface, surface area of the Lake Chad Basin. It is very variable, just like the, temp, uh, the precipitation is variable. The same thing with the water level. And then we, you can see the difference that about 60% of the population in Lake Chad rely heavily on agriculture for their livelihood. So if there's variability in, in the water level and in rainfall in that area, so you expect also that it's going to impact the agricultural activities in the area. And this is our result also in MAP. You can see from 2012 up to 2022, 2019, a little high, slow. And then you can see 2015 is smaller, the water reduced. If you look at 2021, there's an increase in the southern part, of, um, northern part of the lake here. And you compare it with what happens in 2012, there's nothing. So the water level in that area fluctuates very, it's very, very variable. These are also the maps that we produce for land surface temperature during the day and during the night. We have the next slide show during the night. And you can see the temperature variation also in this area is high. And that of the night too. Okay, now you see the graph showing the different temperature variation. You can compare it later with what we have from precipitation and also what we have from vegetation. And we have the normalized difference vegetation index from vegetation. Uh, this shows the hardness index of the vegetation around the area. And you can see the different changes in 2012 and then we compare it with what is happening around the lake also. It's, you know, like goes up and down, very variable. And it is portrayed here by the graph. You know, in 2015, it was down and then it goes high again in 2019, 2020, and it's going down in 2021 and also increase in 20. And this is the rainfall analysis of the area. Almost the same pattern with the temperature and also the vegetation. It's, they are co-dependent on in the area. You have the rainfall in analysis in the table and you can see the graph the trend in the annual rainfall. August has the highest, August, October, July, the highest in the area. And then you see, if you, if you recall the last slides, in 2015 it was low also, and the same thing for the rainfall, and it's high around 2019, 2020. The same thing with temperature in the area, because there's high, very high temperature in the area. When there is high rainfall, then high temperature. And because of the, temp the high temperature in the area and the high humidity, that lead to much more higher evapotranspiration in the area. So I put all the five variables together. And you can see that the fluctuation in water surface area also mimic the same thing with NDVI and the rainfall as well as the evapotranspiration. And um, almost 95% confident interval because our R square is 0 0.87. So you can see when people say that climate change also contributes to that, Yes, based on the result we have been getting, yes, it contributes because the water level mimic what happens with the precipitation, the same thing with vegetation, and uh, 
the evapotranspiration in the area. So in order to be sure of what we are getting, there are a lot of other studies that have been done in the area. This was conducted by uh, uh, Professor Ibrahim Goni from University of Meduguri, which is situated in the lectured basin area. And uh, if you look at it, he did analysis from 1915 up to 2017 using historical data. The same thing, a lot of fluctuation, and then the trend of very, very high variation within the years. You can see the water level also from a study conducted by Charles Ichoku from NASA, which I'm part of uh, the authors too. Uh, it also shows that the level of waters, you know, mimic what happens with precipitation, uh, rainfall in the area. And this was done from 1920 up to 2000. The same thing happened for another study that was conducted from 1980 to 2016. You can see the coloration between precipitation and evaporation in the area. It's almost like going, when it's high, it goes high. The same thing happened. And with regards to human activities in the area, a study was conducted by uh, Churchill. This was the study that we conducted, that I presented on Thursday on land productivity. Um, if you look at 2001 to 2015, uh, 2001 to 2015, you find out that the red color here is declining in productivity. And the subsequent, all those slides that I show, there's a reduction in rain for 2015, even in um, uh, temperature, even in evapotranspiration 2015. So the same thing, we use at, at dot, uh, trend dot at to do our analysis. Uh, it's showing also the same thing here. Now when I compare it with what Churchill has done, these are the area that is most active when it comes to um, populations, very high population in the southern part of the basin and with high anthropogenic activities, and those are the areas that you have decline in uh, vegetation. So that also, uh, you know, support the idea that, okay, there's also human activity impacting the area. But the subsequent ones, uh, subsequent years, like um, till recent, there's an increase in land productivity of the area. Why? Because of migration movement uh, due to insurgency. A lot of people have moved away and the vegetation in the area rejuvenated. That was why you saw from 2019 there's a little increase in vegetation in, in the NDVI that I showed before. So, in conclusion, Lake Chad is heavily influenced by the basin wet and dry periods. However, since 1970, the lake water level has decreased drastically due to climate variability and human activity, resulting in a significant reduction in the size. So according to UNEP, you know, the Chari Lagone River has discharged like seven, by 75%. It is supposed to be 90, up to 95%, but because of activities in that area, it has also reduced for the past 40 years. So, and, Various different researchers demonstrated how human activities also impact, not just the climate uh, uh, variables that changes, also hotspot for human activities before the insurgency. So uh, if you look at it, even in the Ch Chari River, you can see rainfall, you can see Chari River, and then the lake level, they almost mimic the same pattern of uh, reduction. So, based on the outcome of the research and subsequent ones, we have recommendations, and this involve enhancing climate change mitigation efforts. It's imperative to step up 
you know, to combat the change giving it effect on the lectured area, strengthening adaptation strategies for places, especially Africa, dealing with effect of climate change, it is crucial to develop and put into place actions strongly adopted water. This can make investment in water management system, encourage sustainable agriculture, and enhance infrastructure resistance to harsh weather in the area. Uh, we want foster more international collaboration because one organization cannot just work in Lecture. It's a very large area with different countries. And that's why in 2018, the president of the then president of Nigeria, Mahmoud Buhari, uh, put together, uh, we have a conference, international conference, that involves almost eight presidents from different countries around the area to chat out a way forward for restoration of the lab. And the um, European uh, Union was part of it, as especially Italian government was also part of it. And Germany, G GZ, also working in lecture commission, were all part of those um, international conference, and there was an agreement then on how to go forward, and one of the agreement was to do feasibility study before the transfer of water from Congo to the uh, lake, because uh, we don't just want to start transferring, but you want to know what happens to the Congo side if you are transferring water from that place to the lake Chad. It's the same thing that happened to the lake Chad, not going to happen in that area, and so there was an agreement then, but that is under lake Chad Basin Commission. So how far they have gone, uh, it's, it's left to them. I, I can't say much about that. And then raising awareness and promote education in that area, like you, just like uh, Professor Kati giving me an opportunity to say something about lecture is part of raising awareness. Uh, we, we need more that. So we need more awareness about the place. And then not even outside the place, also in the basin area so that people will know how to um, uh, interact with the environment, how to manage the resources within the environment in order to, to sustainably manage the water in the area. So support for research and monitoring. Yeah, we, we are trying our best in, in, in Nigeria, in especially Nigerian Space Agency. We depend on government's funding for this research. But uh, it will be okay if we have different organizations coming in to say okay, there's a, a, a space agency in Nigeria that is doing one or two things about this. Maybe we could use them, especially when it comes to capacity, human capacity, and when it comes to local logistics. So we are there to work with any organization that want to work in lecture, not just lecture, even other areas in agriculture, um, in climate change. We have all those divisions in, in the area. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. To talk. Sorry, I'm just looking at my watch. Um, we do indeed have a couple of minutes for questions if anyone would like to ask one. Please come to a microphone at the front there, either side. Maybe I can ask one then. Um, when you, you've given a whole set of recommendations, uh, these are different recommendations, I think, to different bodies. So some are global, some are regional, some are local. Um, do you have good uh, interactions with them to uh, see the progress of the recommendations and maybe think about what other opportunities there might be for research or what other needs there might be for monitoring, for example? to uh, ensure that the recommendations are taken up by the relevant stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kat. Uh, um, some of these recommendations, when, when we start working on lecture, we were working with lecture basing commission. So we, whatever research we do, we used to give it to them, and they publish it even in their annual, uh, by annual report. But we cannot f f force them to use whatever we do, but we can only contribute. And uh, especially during this insurgency period, most of their focus now is more of 
conflict resolution than science itself. So, um, because of the war, so both we our own responsibility is, especially my agency, is to do research and not put it on the shelf. Is to recommend to the decision makers and see how they can. It's, it's not easy to communicate science, you know. So we have to find a way to break it down into a level that we understand. But I think they are trying, especially with the awareness and education part. Yeah, like Child Basic Commission is doing. In Nigeria, we are doing that. We attend workshop. We co-organize with Ministry of Water Resources uh, in order to, to show them what satellite can do and what result we are getting. And for international organization, uh, we work with NASA, uh, sponsored by Science Foundation. I have my PhD in this area and from UMKC. It, part, of its, part of the sponsor is from National Science Foundation. So definitely sure we invite them to come and make the presentation when there's a conference like this in Nigeria so that the lawmakers and the decision maker we, we use the result. So, but that's the extent we can do. We cannot force them to, to, to adopt the result. So the clock is winding down very quickly and is going to shortly turn red. So I suggest now we uh, give Ricky a very warm round of applause and thank us so much. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Actually, I was not aware that I was supposed to introduce our speaker. And it seems as Miura is our president is not here, I seem to have to do this task. <laughs> so I'm very happy to introduce um, the IAGA Union lecturer, Max Moorkamp, who will talk about from groundwater to tectonics place, imagine, imaging the earth across the scales with electromagnetic methods. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you everybody for coming on a Sunday morning. So in the next 30 minutes, I want to show to you how electromagnetic methods can help us to understand the Earth uh, a little bit better and uh, solve a range of soci um, relevant societal issues from a variety of scales, whole continents to very localized scales. And my talk is divided in four sections. I first want to show you why electromagnetic methods are particularly interesting to solve these issues. I will explain a few fundamental principles of electromagnetic imaging, and then I'll take you on a tour around the world with four different case studies that highlight some of the recent work that has been done in electromagnetic research, and I'll uh, close with what I think are some of the most promising future directions. So to understand the appeal of electromagnetic methods, we uh, can look at Australia, and there's, I think, some of the most exciting research in, uh, well, geophysics, but also in electromagnetic is happening at the moment. So the Australian government, as part of their Exploring for the Future program, aims at covering the entire continent of Australia with airborne electromagnetic data at 20-kilometer line spacing. So far, they have completed about 60% of this, and you can see a map here of the vast coverage they have achieved um, with this method, and this is going to be the largest airborne EM survey um, in existence. And at the same time, they're going to complement this with um, a magnetotelluric survey, and I will talk about the magnetotelluric methods uh, a little bit more later, um, at a half degree spacing. So this will mean about 3,000 magnetotelluric sites, of which they have already acquired um, 1,300. And the goal, according to the OSLAMP website, which is part of this uh, Exploring for the Future program, is to help identify mineral and energy uh, potential at a broad regional scale and also analyzing the risk to Australia's electricity infrastructure. So why does the Australian government spend these large amounts of money on these methods? And uh, the key lies in the physical property that we can resolve with electromagnetic methods, and that's electrical resistivity. And electrical resistivity within the Earth varies by several orders of magnitudes. Here on the left-hand side, you can see a diagram of different Earth materials and their resistivities, and you can see we, have, we go from several thousands, hundreds of thousands, to 
uh, one or less ohm meters. So we have huge co uh, property contrasts. Um, and as a rule of thumb, dry rocks are generally resistive, and we typically show them as blue. You will see this in the, in the case studies that I show a little bit later. And a lot of things that we're interested in finding, um, metals, but also melts if we want to study volcanoes, or the salinity of water, they cause severe reductions in resistivity, and so they show up as anomalies in our data. And another factor that makes electromagnetic methods particularly appealing are that s s relatively small amounts of these conductive phases can determine the bulk resistivity. So we can pick up uh, s percents of melt in, in, this, in the earth or sort of small amounts of um, salt water. So which methods do we have at our disposal to, to image the earth? Um, one of them, or like a whole set of them, is uh, so-called controlled source methods. These can be used on land, but the most prominent use is in airborne and marine environments. So on the left-hand side here, you can see a helicopter dragging an, uh, a control source electromagnetic system that has the source and the receiver together in, in this uh, pack down, down, down here. Um, the obvious advantage of this is that you can cover large areas very quickly, and because you have a known source, you're uh, supplying your own signal, you have very high noise uh, resilience, you have good resolution and reliability of the measurement system. But one of the disadvantages of these control source systems is that the numerical modeling and the inversion of these data sets is computationally extremely expensive. In the marine environment, we have similar setups. Um, so we either have seafloor receivers uh, on the floor or receivers uh, dragged um, over the seafloor, uh, and then a transmitter that, again, supplies a signal, and we can cover sort of large amounts of the seafloor um, with good resolution very quickly. Um, a second class, and the one I want to focus on a little bit more, uh, are so-called na natural source methods, and this is mainly magnetotellurics. These use global lightning and solar wind as a very wideband energy source, uh, and we set up a measurement site, and you can see the schematics here, here on the left, where we simultaneously measure the horizontal electric field with these um, electrode pairs, um, and the magnetic field with either induction coils or flux gate ma magnetometers um, at the same time in the same location. And by doing this, we can calculate a transfer function between the electric and magnetic field that only depends on the Earth resistivity. To show you a bit how this looks in practice, here is a setup that we did recently at, at Mount St. Helens. And because we dug in the electric field lines, you can see these um, sort of pairs of, of electrodes here. For scale, this little black dot here, that's uh, a bunch of solar panels and some people. So you can see we, we occupy a reasonable um, amount of space, but these, these methods have been applied in, in a whole bunch of, of um, environments. And here you can see now annotated the two um, polarizations of the electric field that we measure and the different uh, magnetic sensors that we uh, deploy. Now, after processing these kind of measurements, we get the so-called magnetotelluric impedance tensor. It's complex and frequency dependent, but, and typically we plot it as, as these apparent resistivity and phase plots. So if you ever look at a um, MT publication, you will probably see some sort of plot like this. Um, in these plots, frequency is a proxy for depth. You can see here that, again, we have a really wide band response of um, seven orders of magnitude, and this was acquired with two days of measuring with modern broadband equipment, so we can get very broadband responses in, in good uh, environments uh, very quickly. Um, and to give you an idea about the depths that we're looking at here, so the highest frequency here, we're governed by uh, induction physics, and so the skin depth is the sort of um, factor that uh, determines how deep we look. We're looking at a, sort of a couple of hundred meters here uh, for the highest uh, frequencies. We are at around five kilometers here in the middle, and then we go down to probably about several hundred kilometers. I mean, these numbers are very rough estimates. And 
to interpret these, these curves in a very qualitative sense, uh, we can look at the change of apparent resistivity with frequency. Um, and for example, for this curve, we would say we have something moderately resistive, about 1,000 ohmmeters in the shallow subsurface. We probably have some sort of intermediate conductor at a few kilometers depth, and then in the upper mantle lithosphere, um, we see uh, a more conductive structure. Now you will see I'm plotting here two different um, curves. These correspond to the different polarizations that we measure, and the difference between those curves is a um, measure of lateral heterogeneity. So the fact that we have differences between here means that we not only have changes of resistivity with depth, but also uh, in, a, in a 3D environment. Now, this of course is a nice sort of qualitative um, example or qualitative interpretation, but we need to go or want to move to more quantitative um, interpretations. And for this, we have modern 3D uh, inversion methods, and these are now state of the art. So here I'm showing you an example from my own work in central Botswana, uh, where we had measurements uh, at these black dots, and then through 3D inversion could turn it into this distribution of resistivity as a function of um, horizontal space and, and depth. And there are now several open source codes available to the community uh, that can be used to do this analysis. So um, the vast majority of FMT publications now uh, uses these 3D um, inversion approaches to um, create relatively detailed 3D models of, of electrical resistivity. So let's start our tour and we'll start in the United States looking at the large scale tectonic images and this is from a recent publication from Montjean Greiver and EPSL earlier this year. So they took what is basically the predecessor or the, the, the brainchild to the Australian program, the US uh, array MT transportable array data that has been acquired over the last 16 years. So this started in the sort of 2000s uh, and has covered now most of the uh, central um, United States with a little gap here in, in the southeast that is still to, to be closed. Uh, and the data set now comprises 1,400 sites and is openly available to the community. And the particular um, thing about the Munching Graver study that they now published the first sort of integrated model of a, a whole continental survey like this. So you can see we have the electrical conductivity here over the whole United States. Um, this is a conductivity slice at 40 kilometers. You can see the typical sort of low conductivity is in blue and high conductivity in red. And we can see significant variations in, in conductivity. So for example, here in the western United States around the basin range, we see widespread high conductivity. This is probably related to lower crustal fluids and melt, and we can also see how this is associated with the volcanism in the area. And then we can see regions like the slave craton uh, up here that come up as blue because they are dry and sort of relatively unmodified rocks. Um, looking a little bit deeper in the upper mantle, we can still see that there are significant variations in, in mantle conductivity across the United States. Um, one thing I just want to pick out here is, for example, the, sorry, uh, the comparison between the superior craton here, which comes up as a, a sort of region of, of blue, uh, compared to the Wyoming crater, craton further to the west, we where we don't see what we would call in EM the typical cratonic um, signature of this low conductivity or high resistivity. So that suggests that there has been some sort of modification to the lithosphere in the Wyoming crater. Another interesting feature that we can pick up in this large survey is here in, on the East Coast where we can see a strong difference between the Appalachians and the further coastal regions. Um, and again, the coastal regions high, uh, show a much higher resistivity. And for example, here Munch and Graver uh, interpret this as a strong contrast um, that's associated with a possible lithospheric step. So here you can see how we can sort of get information about the deep earth. 
And of course, these sort of what I would call a structural interpretation, where you just look at the shape of different anomalies, are, are very interesting. But ideally, we want to go further. And first attempts have been made now to translate uh, electrical conductivity into composition and temperature. Um, so here, Munch and Graver um, set up a model where they uh, recover water content, basalt fraction, and mantle potential temperature from their data. Uh, and you can see, for example, that the lithosphere in the central United States is comparatively dry to um, the sort of out western and eastern United States where it seems to have higher water content. Now, if you look at the temperature, for example, there seems to be quite a bit of scatter. Um, so these methods are still being developed, and um, there's still a lot of work to, to, to be done, also from the petrological side, to understand these variations. Uh, but we can see how we can move to a more sort of quantitative and geologically relevant interpretation. The next um, example I want to show you is from Antarctica, from a, a study of Hill et al. Um, and Nature Communications last year. So they looked at this uh, Mount Erebus and the volcanic magmatic system there. Um, so Mount Erebus, you can see, see the map here, and you can see the, the sort of station coverage of like about uh, just over 100 sites over, over the, the, the volcano. Um, now, polar environments pose particular challenges, not just because of the severe weather, which um, affects sort of all methods, but also in particular to EM. But over the last uh, 20 years, several large-scale surveys have been conducted, so we can do MT in these polar environments. Uh, and uh, here, Erebus um, is a, a good example as a classic sort of rift-related volcano, and the main question that Hill et al. try to answer here is the relationship between the magmatic system that we observe um, in the, uh, near the surface uh, and a possible mantle source. So they perform a, a 3D inversion of their data, and you can see the results here going from about 3 kilometers, 6 kilometers, then down to about 60 kilometers. So you can see we have sort of reduced our scale to a much more, more local level. Um, we can see this uh, large-scale um, low resistivity or high conductivity at around 3 kil kilometers. Uh, now, this is not thought to be melt, which would also have a low resistivity, but probably um, a clay coverage um, associated with alteration of the, of the volcanic uh, material. And then further, uh, going further down, we can see here in the, in the center this really low resistivity uh, anomaly. So that's the, the magmatic conduit that we can sort of trace down further to depth. So at, at 14 kilometers, you can see that that becomes the, the dominating feature in these inversions. And it even can be traced down to about 60 kilometers. Um, and if we look at sort of vertical um, slices through the same system, this becomes even more apparent. So we can see there are sort of different views here, but I'm going to focus on the slice through the center of the volcano. And we can really see how this um, low resistivity zone extends from the surface with some sort of changes in geometry down to depth of about 60. 60 to 100 kilometers, and Hill et al. perform sensitivity studies to make sure that these are actually features that are required by the data, uh, and they, they say that they can sort of trace this down to this depth. And it's pe peculiar here that we have this change in direction of the um, magmatic system coming, coming up from depth, um, and the um, interpretation that is provided here that, well, the, the high conductivity or low resistivity is um, related to ascending magma, and that this change in direction is um, structurally controlled by um, large-scale crustal faults, uh, and they also propose a so-called fault wave, uh, wealth behavior of the system so that this fault and the pressure uh, relationship at this fault basically control the eruptive behavior of Mount Erebus. Another peculiar thing is that uh, they see this, this uh, system going up all the way to the surface, 
which is something, for example, that's not ex um, shown uh, seen at subduction volcanoes. Uh, and the explanation here is that this is a CO2-driven system versus the more water-driven system at uh, subduction volcanoes, and that this changes the sort of the way the, the magma ascends and how how far it goes up into the, into the surface. As a third example, I will show you a, a geothermal um, exploration example from my own work that was published uh, three years ago in the Geophysical Journal International. So this was based on a commercial survey of 300 or more than 300 uh, broadband MT sites. So you can see on the left-hand side here um, the, the station coverage. And this is a typical commercial survey that would be performed now in industry for, to solve these kind of problems. And on the right-hand side, you can see what that area looks like now. So a geothermal power plant has been built based on the models that, that were provided um, here. And uh, I mean, because we have a lot of boreholes in this area, and these are shown here in white, so we have 10, 10 different boreholes, um, this is also an interesting case study to understand the stability of MT inversion methods. Because like all geophysical methods, we, uh, we have these ill-posed and non-unique uh, inversion problems, so we want to see how much do the choices that we make during the analysis of our data affect the outcome. And here we can see two different models that have been generated from two different starting models. So basically the, the initial guess that we provide as scientists for the structure of the Earth. At the top, we, uh, this is a so-called half space where everything has been assigned the same resistivity. Uh, we are sort of as neutral as we possibly can. Uh, and at the bottom, we have started with a layered uh, starting model. So um, we have changed the resistivity uh, in the Earth as a function of depth uh, based on what we think are reasonable resistivities within the Earth. Um, those lines here, those are the, lithology, or the different colors are lithologies uh, from, from those boreholes, and they are here used as a benchmark to see the difference and uh, judge the, the quality of the results. Um, you can see clearly there are some differences between those models. They're not exactly identical, but the large-scale structure is extremely similar. We can also see the very good correspondence with especially this lower horizon here, and this is the sediment basement interface, so the low resistivity here is um, caused by relatively young sediments, and the higher resistivity here at the bottom, that's the, the basement. And we can actually surprisingly well sort of recover this basement structure, and we can also see that between those two models, even there are some differences. Um, the basement structure that we would use for interpretation actually does not um, vary significantly. Similarly, we always have to choose when we do these inversions how we discretize the Earth, so how fine or coarse do we try to um, recover this kind of variation. So here I'm comparing two different um, levels of, of, of detail. So on the top end, uh, this is a relatively coarse grid that we use, and this was the one that we act was actually used in the, um, in the commercial study. Uh, and then down here, um, I used a much finer grid. Um, again, you can see differences, and especially this fine grid gives you, if you want, so the illusion of more detail, some of especially that um, near-surface structure seems much more sort of connected and you, you, you seem to sort of recover um, sort of fine-scaled variations here. Um, however, the relevant factors here, for example, this displacement of this large conductor here to, to the uh, west, which is, indicated, is indicating a fault, and again, the basement structure um, are relatively similar. So um, there are variations based on the choices we made, and we have to be careful, of course, in our analysis, but in the end, it doesn't really matter um, sort of so much what, what we use, and we get sort of relatively stable results, which, of course, is good news for, for the analysis of this kind of data. As a final example, I want to go to Hawaii and 
offshore groundwater studies have received significant attention in recent years. So um, sources of sweet, um, or low salinity water have been found in marine environments. And obviously, this is a big question for the supply of water to, to coastal communities. Can this water be used? What are the dynamics with the salt water of the oceans around them? Uh, and there has been a number of studies, and here I'm, I've picked out a study by Atias et al. that was published in Science Advances in 2020. Um, they didn't use magnetotellurics that the previous studies were based on, but control source EM in a marine environment. Um, and they show their results here as these sort of slices around the island of Hawaii. Uh, and you can see that they recover in their models significant uh, resistivity variations between like low resistivity structures here on top and then sort of um, higher resistivity in, in, in the center and, and potentially lower resistivity at the bottom again. The assumption in interpreting these data is that lithology does not play a major role in determining this resistivity, uh, and that seems reasonable because most of the material here is probably volcanically derived basalts, so that you, sh you wouldn't expect major changes in the, the lithological resistivity. Uh, and so the assumption is that the resistivity mainly uh, depends on the salinity of the water that's in the pore space of, of the lithology and possibly the porosity. Now, uh, Atias and I'll argue that porosity here is not enough to explain these large variations in resistivity, so they interpret the, the, this mainly as um, sort of changes in salinity, and so you would have this sort of salt water, low resistivity structure at the top, uh, and then this uh, trapped low uh, salinity water in, in the center here. And their conceptual sketch that they put forward is um, shown here on, on the left. So you have the, the seawater intrusion into the basalts at the, at the top. Um, and then you have fresh water sort of coming in from, from the island of Hawaii. And the feature that separates those two are some thin, low permeability layers. For example, something like the clay layer that we saw at Mount Erebus could provide a, a sort of dividing feature between those two aquifers. And this is a fairly complex flow pattern. You can see we have these sort of in, this interbedding of fresh and sweet water, uh, and of course that still needs some, some checking. In this case, there are no boreholes in this area, so, but some ground truthing of this would, would certainly be ex extremely interesting. So with that, I've sort of concluded my um, tour of, of, of recent studies, and I want to outline a little bit what I think are sort of interesting future, future directions. Um, one development that's happening actually here in Germany at the moment is the uh, development of so-called semi-airborne methods. So instead of having both the source and the receiver on the aircraft, you put the um, source in the ground, and this has a, a number of advantages. First of all, you can put a lot more energy into the ground because you're not bound by the energy consumption and the size restrictions that you have on, on the aircraft. Uh, and that allows sort of deeper penetration of the electromagnetic fields. The other advantage is because we don't have these many different sources that move along with the aircraft, we can actually perform full 3D inversions of these kind of data. We only need um, a few uh, sources. And here on the right-hand side, you can see the first results from a study by Rochlitz et al. Uh, published earlier this year based on sort of four different sources and a whole sort of airborne survey um, across it. Uh, and they perform, yeah, they recover these low resistivity structure that they r relate to mineralization and um, in, the, in the Harz Mountains in this case. And the nice thing about this is that uh, certainly in sort of urbanized areas such as Germany, the controlled source nature of this makes it suitable for these what we call, would call high noise environments. And we also get relatively high resolution at intermediate depth, so the, the scale here, which unfortunately is a bit small, is on the order of like a kilometer, so we can look at the upper kilometer of the Earth with uh, very good detail. 
Another future direction and one that I'm particularly interested in are so-called joint inversion methods, so where we combine electromagnetic or other data with other geophysical techniques. Here's an example that I published in GRL last year where I combined uh, magnetotellurics and gravity measurements to get a combined resistivity and density model. Uh, and the joint inversion sort of puts a quantitative, con quantitative connection between those two, uh, two uh, physical properties. Um, and you can see here the, the strong similarity between the results. But the b big advantage that we have with these kind of co coupled approaches is that we have a extra analysis dimension. So for example, here, this is the basin and range down here. You see this low resistivity and those extend all across the Snake River Plain. From the MT data alone, we wouldn't be able to say, are there any changes in what causes this low resistivity? But then if we compare this with the density, we can see that in some parts there is a negative density anomaly and that would suggest something like fluids or melt and in other parts we have this relatively higher densities which would suggest that this is caused by sulfides and graphite. So combining these different types of, of data really gives us additional information that then we can use to, to understand the earth better. And the final development I want to highlight is the move from, yeah, 3D to 4D, so we put in the time component uh, into these electromagnetic surveys and sort of first studies have been done in the past and we are currently working at Mount St. Helens where we repeated a, a survey that was done in 2005 uh, last year and actually about a month ago, so we just came back from the field and here are the very first results that we have from that. You can see the comparison between the old data and the new data. And the good news is we can reproduce some of our data, so it's not like we sort of have a reproducibility problem, but at some sites, and especially the sites here near the volcanic edifice, we can see significant differences in the apparent resistivity and also the magnetotelluric phase that I didn't talk about much very more uh, before that indicate that something really has changed in the resistivity structure. And this is then helps us to understand the dynamics of this volcanic system, but obviously this can also be applied to aquifers, to geothermal heat production, and other um, systems where we want to understand the changes. So with that, I'd like to summarize. Well, I hope I convinced you that electromagnetic methods are really useful in a wide variety of contexts. I haven't touched on mineral exploration, and actually EM methods are one of the prime methods to use in the exploration for critical minerals, but also conventional minerals. With modern equipment, we can measure wide bands responses quickly and efficiently, so we can get high quality data relatively fast, and we have now the analysis tools to create detailed models of the subsurface, and we're starting also to move from just thinking about resistivity and conductivity to actually the composition and sort of temperature of the subsurface. And with that, I'd like to thank the Yaga Executive Committee for nominating me for this lecture and the members of the Division 6 of the EM community for the great community that they are and sort of, you know, putting out these studies. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the German Science Foundation for funding me for the last five years and my collaborators and the members of my working group uh, who have made all this work possible. And I leave you with a picture that we took about a month ago at Mount St. Helens where we now installed this MT monitoring station to look at the changes of the system over time. Can I have the mic? Thank you. Thank you, Max, for your contribution. And I would like to ask Trevor McDowell to do the introduction now for Martin Fisbeck. Yep, so. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce the IAPSO version of the Union Lecture. And this is always a highlight uh, of these meetings. Um, and uh, today's uh, lecturer is Martin uh, Fisbeck. He um, works at the, as a head of the physical oceanography at uh, Guillemar in Kiel. Um, and his area of interest is uh, parameterizing mixing in models and in understanding upwelling systems. And his latest uh, passion is digital twins. 
and uh, it's nothing to do with the fact he's recently become a grandfather. Um, Martin is the lead of um, Future Ocean uh, Network uh, in Kiel. Uh, he's on an amazing number of international um, governing boards, advisory committees. For instance, he's a member of the governing board of the International Science Council, uh, the peak body of the peak bodies in science. Um, a member of the governing board of WCIP, the World Climate Research Program, and of WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. He's an elected fellow of AGU, the American Geophysical Union, of the American Meteorological Society, AMS, of TOS, the Oceanographic Society, and the uh, and the uh, International Science Council, fellow of the International Science Council. Uh, and he's elected fellow of the European um, Academy of Science. He's the recent recipient of the Henry Stommel Research Award uh, Medal from the American Meteorological Society. Um, and he's a past member of the um, Interim Decade Advisory Panel of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science uh, decade for sustainable development. And it's with that expertise, of course, that he'll be uniquely qualified to um, edify us today. Uh, Martin, I applaud you for your um, incredible leadership in so many different forums in oceanography, um, internationally and, of course, uh, in Germany. And I invite you to um, come and deliver the lecture. Well, Trevor, thank you very much for this kind introduction and colleagues, it's just a fantastic opportunity for me to speak here to you in front of the IOGG General Assembly in Berlin, in Germany, my home country. And it's been a fantastic week so far and I'm so glad to be able to speak to you what I think about the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, what it maybe has done a little bit for my own science, but maybe will also done do to some of your sciences here. Now we speak, spoke this morning about some hydrology, about the deep earth, but 70% of our planet is covered by earth, and I sometimes do like this little projection. It's a Spielhaus projection of our global ocean, and we see so much here at the IOGG assembly, Mercator projections. And in Mercator, you have this idea that there's a Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, a Southern Ocean, Arctic Ocean, but actually there's only one ocean. And I think the Spielhaus projection puts that fact out so much more into the center, and I think this is what I want to talk about. From a perspective of uh, my association here, physical science of the ocean Yapso, Trevor is the president, I guess outgoing president, I would say. So why an ocean decade? Now at Yapso, we promote the study of the ocean, its interaction with the seafloor, coastal, atmospheric boundaries, and we focus on mathematics, physics, and to some degree chemistry. But that is maybe not the reason, Trevor, why we do an ocean decade. Now, my most favorite committee member these days is ChatGPT. So I thought I should ask ChatGPT about why an ocean decade. But first thing, uh, the international committee said it's the ocean we need for the future we want. That's before ChatGPT. And I like that, the ocean we need for the future we want. I think the ocean is part of our future. And then for us more ho at home, the science we need for the ocean we want. It's really focusing on the science at the EPSO that is playing out to the ocean, to us interacting with the ocean. But ChatGPT says this decade is about ocean health and conservation. Now, when we talk colloquially about ocean health, they're meaning a productive ocean, a healthy ocean, reefs, and so on. We don't talk about ocean disease, which is another very interesting science. Conservation is preserving the ocean that we know, and I think marine scientists are very much into conservation because we don't like that the ocean is used or overused. It's about sustainable development. So we have the sustainable development goals, and the ocean decade supports the ocean dimension of that. It's about collaborative approaches. I think this audience knows everything about collaborative approaches because the science we do depends on international collaboration and the progress we make, we share around the planet, certainly what the ocean decade does. 
It's about scientific research and innovation. I think this community is at the center of that, in particular as it pertains to physics and mathematics, more the physical aspect, maybe some of the chemistry as well. And last but not least, I think the Ocean Decade really brings out a call towards awareness and education. A lot of people, maybe not even here at the IOGG, know about the importance of the ocean for humanity, know about the exciting science in the ocean. If you leave then this center and go to Berlin, this in the city, or go to your own uh, works of life, I think we have a lot to do, and I think the Ocean Decade wants to do that. Now, if I put my committee hat on, you get a picture like this, right? Now, I'm not going to read out all the committees here. Certainly, sustainable development goals, you know. But there's a very interesting high-level panel on the sustainable ocean economy that looks at how we can use the ocean more responsible. And I'm going to just mention the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, where yesterday's gold medal lecture was given from Valerie, I think, who gave us a great idea of what IPCC does and how important this is to the work that we do here. But this UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable has this mission of transforming ocean science solution for sustainable development, transforming the science we do and connecting people and the ocean. And I'm going to give you just a few minutes of the introduction to the decade, which was done virtually in Berlin in the launch. So here are a few words from some people you might or might not know. I hope the sound is on. The ocean acts as a climate machine, economic space, and a source of food for many, many people around the globe. And I would like to invite all of you to join us for a dive into the unknown secrets of the ocean. The future of our Earth thus heavily depends on how we treat our oceans. Germany has proved itself to be a competent and reliable partner in this field. We need to start living in harmony with the ocean. It is time for a revolution in ocean science. And this revolution now has a name, the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Together, let us discover the science we need for the ocean we want. This uh, decade offers a unique opportunity, a clear framework for action by better coordinating global efforts. We are very much aware that to reach our European Green Deal ambitions and make Europe a climate neutral continent by 2050, we need healthy oceans. The agreed ambition of the G7 to tackle climate change, which of course is such a stressor on the ocean system. The ocean is our future. It's become increasingly obvious that ocean science must be the foundation upon which the achievement of SDG 14 is built. I can tell you that uh, we do not have time we have to act now. There's a lot of traditional knowledge in our region built up over millennia uh, that we could make use of in the global science community. We have to think seven generations ahead. And this is preserved through a process which they call Rawi. So in certain places when they fish, for example on the reef itself, there is a section that they have to block, which is tough, that no one touches. it. We need international organizations and we need the willingness to protect uh, us from illegal fishing. We, while we are trying to find solutions for a different future, for a different ocean, we have to learn to be resilient, to adapt to the things to come. It needs to be part of our jobs to think about partnerships. You know, for us it's about um, transforming uh, the industries as they are now into, into a sustainable future. I think this next generation is um, ready to take on this challenge, especially if the international community does what the Ocean Decade is doing here today. I think that we need to improve the way we communicate science to the general public. So I think these voices gave such a wonderful introduction to the ambition of the Ocean Decade. It's global, it's across generations, across actor space. And if you want to read this slide, you can learn about the org chart of the decade, which I won't read to you, uh, but certainly it is well organized. But the decade has put out 10 challenges. 
So one is to look at pollution and contaminants, maybe not so much what IUGG is working on, but you can be aware of that that is important for the ocean space. It's about solutions to protect, monitor, and manage the ecosystems. Again, nothing in the IOGZ centrally that we do something about, but there's some connection to that. It's about thinking about sustainable feeding the world's population, and maybe fish isn't the way to go, maybe bile maybe algae from the ocean. It's about equitable and sustainable development of the ocean economy. I mentioned the ocean panel there, which I think does remarkable work. It's focusing on the ocean climate nexus that we heard a lot about here at this IOGG meeting. What is the role of ocean and climate? But it's multi-hazard warning system. Krista, you had a session already on tsunamis and other hazards we heard this morning from Lake Chat. It's about ocean observing system. I mentioned that in a moment. It's about digital representation of the ocean, Trevor, one of the areas that I'm interested, but many of you are working on, I think and also to build capacity and provide equitable access to data information and knowledge. Some work that we do with Cabo Verde that we're very proud of in the context of the decade, really bringing West African scientists up together and thinking about their contribution and their needs for ocean sciences. And last but not least is to really think about why are we not doing what we're supposed to be doing? I think we feel that here at IOGG as well, that we heard about this this morning. We're giving some advice to disaster risk reduction, but somehow it's not taken up. Why is that? Interesting sciences in that arena. Now, uh, for us, uh, in the more physical science, we have observations, we have models, and I just want to give you a glimpse of how we do that. So at Guillaume, where I work, the Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research, where we have an observing system at 53 degrees north, 25 years of operations. Johannes is there, one of our leading scientists, but many others in my group. And what we do, we're trying to look at, in a quantitative sense, how the so-called Gulf Stream system, the warm water on the top and the cold return flow, how that cold water return flow is changing over time. We couldn't do it just in Germany, although we do a lot of it. There's an international collaboration around that that makes this possible. But I just want to give you one glimpse of science here. So this is 25 years or almost 23 years of variability of something that we call the deep water of the North Atlantic. It's part of the Gulf Stream system, warm water going north, cold water coming south. And you see a wiggly line with some odd units there called swirdrips, which are one million cubic meters per second. And you see it wiggles between 10 and 20. And you might say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, this is the Gulf Stream circulation or the deep water that we think and climate change will change. I'll show a graph in a second. And what we are trying to decipher, what is the signal there? Is there decadal variability? Why is it? What is driving it? This is the kind of science that IAPSO is contributing to the decade, a fundamental understanding of how the ocean system works today and how it might change in the future. When we take our models that we have, and we heard some discussion here at this meeting about it, these are the yellow and the blue curves. The blue curve is a low emission scenario, the red curve is a high emission scenario, and this is the absolute change, and this is the relative change. And you see what we're seeing is a reduction of that uh, circulation that I just showed you, and this little blackish line is all the data that we have, tiny but we need much longer data. And that is hard work, hard lifting for our community to do that. We go to sea every other year, put the instruments in. It's a costly effort for Helmholtz Society to do that. But I think our grandchildren would like to know whether they're gonna be over here, whether it actually did change or not. Not an easy task at all. So how do we know what's happening? Documenting change, we have very famous institutions like the IPCC, again, subject of yesterday's lecture, that told us sea level is rising and what it might mean, for example, I'm just showing you one or two slides, also Ricardo, uh, two days ago, spoke about the declining glaciers. Similar things can be done about biodiversity. It best does the same thing for biodiversity. We're learning that marine species are, we're losing them in the ocean actually at much higher rates than on land, which was something completely new to me. But you can see we're still discovering things in the ocean space. And we have the so-called World Ocean Assessment that really looks at the ocean at the highest level of the UN. It, it reports directly to all the heads of state at the General Assembly. So lots of assessments there. My interest is, well, how will the future look like? How can we get from where we are now on this graph through the lens of the Sustainable Development Goals to a future which is much more sustainable, much more just, much more inclusive science-based? And for that, I think a unique opportunity is that, Trevor, what you mentioned is 
to think about how can we take the knowledge that we have and inform decision makers in a way that they can actually act on it or that they can use for that. So sometimes we call them decision support system. My version of a, a decision support system is a digital twin of the ocean. What the hell is that? So a digital twin of the ocean is nothing less than we're reproducing the ocean in the digital form from informed by what we know today. So it's a collection, the summary of all the things that we know from observations and using all the data, data sharing models, uh, understanding of that, and protecting and generating the knowledge that we want. But digital twins are really good at what we call our what-if questions, and I'm going to give you an example in a second. So what are they good for? I think they're helping us in international science to understand where we are, to point out knowledge areas, knowledge gaps. They help us for the governments, and I'll give you an example in a second, for managing their space. They're interesting for civil society because of, you can interact with them in a very innovative way. They're certainly a key tool for the private sector, a lot of action there already, and I think they can be used for educational purposes. Now, the difference between an observing system that I'm going to point out in a moment, which is a supporting service, and an observing system in the ocean, in the beginning, we put it out there to say, how is the ocean changing over time? What is the state of the ocean today? And we can do what we do in weather forecast. We can take our understanding and project it out for the next couple of weeks, maybe years, to do an ocean forecast system. All of this involves the ocean system, no human intervention. It's a weather forecast for the ocean. In twinning, it is different. In twinning, you say, hey, but the ocean is changing because of human intervention. For example, we put carbon dioxide in the ocean. For example, we change the coastline. So here, in twinning, the question is, how can we optimize our interaction with the ocean for an outcome that we want? That is not a weather forecast. The weather forecast depends on the initial state and then goes a certain direction. Is this new? No. We've been doing digital twinning in our community for quite some time. I'm going to give you one prototype example. What would the global atmosphere or climate temperature look like if you put certain amount of CO2s in the atmosphere? It's a typical what-if question. It involves human interventions. The human intervention is CO2 emissions. We have low emission scenarios, middle of the road or high emission scenarios. I think Ricarda gave a great presentation about what that means for glaciers. But then the IPCC or Earth system models that we're all developing here, the physical component of, tells us for a low emission scenario, maybe we get less than an additional degree from where we are today, middle of the road, maybe one and a half, and an unabated emission scenario up to four degrees. So this digital twin and Earth system model answers the what if question, what if we did a high emission scenario, what if we do a low emission scenario? Very well known to this community, we never called it a digital twin, did we, Trevor? We just called it a system model, right? Not yet. Not yet, yeah. So I'm going to give you uh, another version of that, which I think is more interesting in the space that we heard about Lake Chat. This is, what is the most cost-effective way to mitigate uh, climate change in the coastal region? Think about Sydney. Think about the capital of Ghana. Think about uh, Hamburg, for as an example. So here, uh, the global climate models tell us, IPCC does the assessment, there's a certain amount of sea level rise that we're expecting for the next uh, 50 years, the next 100 years. We can make it more regional, a lot of interesting science. How good are our regional uh, sea level projections? They're actually less good than you think. They're pretty good on the global scale, I would say regionally. It's more difficult. When you take it right down to Sydney Bay, Trevor, where you live, or to Nigeria, then you have to do different sets of models which are much better resolved in the region. But then you can ask the question, if sea level rising by a meter, what can I do? So now you're optimizing intervention. Do I want to build a dike? Maybe you could. But the Netherlands said, no, it's too expensive. The Netherlands said, we're going to build sandbars. Why is that? Because for them, it's sea level rise plus storm surges. And storm surges, you can, the abatement of storm surges, you can reduce by sandbars. In other parts, you have mangrove systems which protect you from the disasters of storm surges and sea level rise or coral reefs, so you can do protection of mangroves, maybe even regrowing them. So there are more than one option, and a digital twin would allow you to find out what is the option for you, what is maybe cost effective, you have some social license on, which is giving you the outcome that you want. So it's an interesting space where an Earth system model plays a role, but it's also part of the negotiation that we want to do. So I think these are 
interesting examples, and I'm going to give you tomorrow a few more, where digital twins can be used to really inform our society and really capture all the knowledge that we have and to bring decision support system to the fore. What do we need for a digital twin? There is no digital twin without an observing system. And the ocean observing system has many components to it. Hydrography is certainly central, but also what's happening in the water. And I think when we look at our observing system today and ask it, is it fit for purpose for the twin of Sydney, for Nigeria or Hamburg, we probably find the answer maybe it isn't, and we need to enhance it. But I think it sets into value much more so the observing system that we have today and give us reasons to grow. I'm sure that's also true for tsunami warning system and other coastal inundation areas that Krista is working on. So what do we have? We have the global ocean observing system. Almost 100 countries are working on that. Look at this map, full of dots. That sounds great, right? But actually, when you look at our poster child observing system, robots of the Argo type, there's two Argo floats for all of Germany to measure the equivalent of Germany in the global ocean. So 4,000 sounds a lot, but when you put it spatially, it's not that many. But still, great progress. So I'm very excited about the Global Ocean Observing System. I think there's room to grow more. We're becoming more inclusive. We want Africa to be a full participant in it and things like that. So good starting point there. It's also space. And space observations are coming up much more so. Unfortunately, the oceanographic community cannot have that much advantage from space uh, satellites because you know, we're pretty opaque to electromagnetic waves in the ocean. So we can look at the surface. We can look at some integral properties like bottom pressure, gravity, and so on. But one exciting thing I wanted to highlight, there's a new mission going up that looks at altimetry, which is a source altimetry, just went up. Fantastic. We're going to change, see much more detail on the ocean, so I'm quite looking forward to that signal. But space is going to be an important part also in forming twins, CubeSats for regional information and so on. Now, none of this will work in a digital twin if you don't have a prediction system of some sorts. So here in many sessions we heard about uh, ocean models, the advancements, AI, and so on. So I think ocean prediction systems are key for informing decision makers. They have to be much more resolved in the coastal arena, so we need much more hands-off between coastal models and global models. I think uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning are already entering in this space, and they'll give us great opportunities for the next 20 years for them to become better. But they also need to be more integrative in terms of the ecosystem, the fisheries, you know, the gravel, and the build-up environment. So I think there's challenges there as well, so you need a good prediction system. But even with observations and a model, nothing will work unless we solve our data problem. Since 30 years, I see Mr. Koltermann sitting there, Peter, we've been discussing this since 30 years in forum like IAPSO, IOGG, ISC, democratize the data, interoperability, sharing of the data, which is so hard for all of us to do, but I think twins will again give another good reason why we need to do that. And it, importantly, which we haven't had so much problem with, is trust in the data. This community has been irrelevant commercially, so fake data wasn't a thing. But when you become relevant, fake data can become a thing. So I think we need to think about how can we make sure that the data that enter in are actually real data rather than fake data and not made up by ChatGPT, right, as an example. So, uh, so great uh, advances there. But I think the exciting piece, too, is that we can deliver digital twin information today in much more modern frameworks. At Geomar, we run this thing called Arena 2. You see a picture here of that. And Arena 2 is nothing else than a planetarium, 120 degrees planetarium. It's about 12 meter wide. So you can see here a couple of decision makers sitting inside. And in this case, our digital twin is the seafloor here. The decision that we're trying to make is planning the next research cruise. And we're sitting inside our arena dome with a couple of scientists who are planning the next cruise. And what we're presenting there or displaying out is the map of the seafloor, and we're optimizing the grabs and the sampling and so on. So it's a clearly decision-making theater for the scientist. Imagine you can just use the same environment by taking a bay of the UK, Kathy, where you're from, and imagine you can dial in how will that bay look like in 20 years and 50 years, depending on human actions. This will make the difference, unlike graphs and maps, which we can understand, but many people not. 
browser-based system Jupyter Notebooks I saw here in the, up where the posters are, a 3D immersive environment. You can put the 3D goggles on, we can use that. Now, in digital twinning, we have great partners from the movie industry because they're extremely interested in using their versions of artificial movings fed with environmental data. So we can forge new partnerships to make this visibility a really an exciting space, not just for the science, but also for engaging and talking about our science. So let me uh, give one more example. So here's a digital twin that is planned out for the Adriatic, that is part of the Mediterranean. Italy is spearheading that a little bit. But I want to use this example, how did we do marine spatial planning over the years? Now, when I was a student in physical oceanography in Kiel, Trevor, we were drawing maps by hand, right? And then plotters showed up. But I had a friend, she was in the geography department, and she said, oh, my other friend, she's a mathematician, like you, Trevor, and she's worked on this crazy thing called GIS, Geographical Information System. Only informatics people can use this. And what it'll do if it goes great, you have a red map and a green map and a yellow map on top of each other. That was the latest in science only informatics students could do. Geographers thought, wow, we can make digital maps. How, how great is that? They were using hand-drawn maps. It shows you how old I am. Now, GIS is a standard tool everywhere you go in your city planner, even in marine spatial planning, we use geographical-based GIS systems, clearly. But they're static maps. We have a fast-changing environment. So I think in a decade, maybe less from now, we'll add to the GIS capability digital twins. They'll be more dynamic, they'll be more 3D, they'll be more interesting, but it's the same step that we went from map drawing by hand to GIS, which transformed the business 50 or 40 or 30 years ago, and I think in the next 10 years, digital twins will be doing that. I'm going to show you one last movie, almost done. As our land disappears, we have no choice but to become the Let's world's first Tuvalu. digital nation. Our land, our ocean, our culture are the most precious assets of our people. And to keep them safe from harm, no matter what happens in the physical world, we'll move them to the cloud. Islands like this one won't survive rapid temperature increases rising sea levels and droughts, so we'll recreate them virtually. Piece by piece, we'll preserve our country, provide solace to our people, and remind our children and our grandchildren what our home once was. Only concerted global effort can ensure that Tuvalu does not move permanently online and disappear forever from the physical plane. Without a global conscience and a global commitment to our shared well-being, we may soon find the rest of the world joining us online as their lands disappear. It has long been the time for action, but we have not stepped up to the challenge. We must start doing so today. Otherwise, within a lifetime, Tuvalu will only exist here. Isn't that a sad statement? That we're using digital twins or the digital environment for preserving heritage? That a whole country goes online, digital in the metaverse, because they don't trust us to take the right action for them to be protecting themselves against sea level rise. Another way where digital and digital twins can, I guess, help. So if you like Digital Twins, join us uh, in Shia Men uh, in November uh, 9 to 12. That's where international experts come together and talk about Digital Twins. Come to my session tomorrow. You can learn more about that. So closing off, Trevor, ChatGPT, the science we need for the ocean we want. In summary, the ocean decade was established to address the urgent needs for sustainable management and conservation of the ocean, aligning the sustainable development goals and fostering collaboration, scientific research, innovation, and public awareness. So in that sense, the decade provides us with an opportunity, at EAPSO, to take our knowledge, our science, and take it into the application arena of informing publics, informing decision-making, decision support system, but I think it also means that the science that we do needs to be still discovering the ocean, still fundamental understanding that never goes away, but having new partnerships in our science can be really exciting. 
So a decade in a snapshot, 50 global projects, Ditto is one of them. We have many other activities around the decade. There's national committees. I urge you to look at your own space, ask about what the decade is doing there. I think it really helps to set in value the great science we do at EAPSO, at the IOGG, and how we can take this fundamental understanding, which is still so important, uh, into the realm of decision making, into the realm of informing our leaders or ourselves for our prosperous future. And if you want to learn more about the decade or are excited about it, there's the Ocean Decade Conference next year in Barcelona, and I invite you all to come. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Martin, for showing us the future, uh, an exciting future, and this from a guy who started his career with coloured pencils uh, instead of a computer. Um, I'm sure you'll take some questions. More than happy to. I think you've got to go to the microphone. Yeah. Hello. Thanks a lot for this presentation. I really do like this approach from the digital twin. Um, we do have a massive amount of data from models, from observation. I think that we will have to think also about how to get synthesized information for the stakeholders then. Could you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great comment. As I said, the biggest challenge around digitization of our ocean and our Earth system in general will be how to handle the data. Some data come from the research domain, which often are more organized. It's about standard setting. But there's exciting data that comes from the public. Citizens are bringing in the private sector's lot of data. We heard some examples just in the union lecture before me. And how are we going to manage this data intelligently is a great science for data scientists and informatics. But I see a lot of action in that space, so I'm personally not worried about it, but it, we need to be very clear on what we want, how we want to organize it, and we have to work in IUGG, in EAPSO, in the International Science Council to really provide equitable access to the data and make them free and open. That is by no means a given. So environmental data, are, many of them are not free and open. I think that is our contribution that we can bring to that, that we have to ask for that and make our own data free and openly available, but only then can we allow other actors, including ourselves, to produce these digital versions of our environment that is then used for exploration and decision making. Thanks for that question. Over here. <clears throat> Very nice talk, uh, Martin. My name is Hans Volkert. I'm from the Yamas side, above the ocean, so to speak. Um, how would you uh, judge uh, these plans and convincing and challenging plans uh, for the ocean as what happened in the atmosphere in the 1960s, the GARP, Global Atmospheric Research Program, sponsored by WMO, you know, and the ICSU at that time. So is it just uh, the ocean following on, or is there something really new and, and, uh, in that? So what is the sequence between atmosphere and uh, ocean, just a factor of 1,000 in density, or <laughs> what else? Great question. I would think quite often in oceanography, marine science, in particular in physical oceanography, we always look up to the atmospheric scientists. They've been 20 years ahead of us. For example, the observing system around weather is well organized, it is international, it is open, it is standardized and mandatory. Ocean observing is volunteer. Big problem, big difference. But I will say that scientifically, we're much more equal players these days. And in some areas, in digital twinning, the oceanographers have a little bit of a leg forward there. The atmospheric scientists are trying to get the hold around it. But I would say we are great partners in climate science. So I would say um, at that time, we had atmospheric science experiments, ocean experiments, land-based experiments. We're now thinking about our Earth system more holistically, seeing about the interfaces, about working together. And that is why I think IODG is so much more important to today, it really brings in all these components of the Earth system and makes sure that we don't work so much in silos, but actually learn from each other and share and contribute to a common goal. And I think the decade helps with that. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question. Um, John Burroughs, University of Bremen and Yamas. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, very much appreciated. My issue, I think you made some good points about um, uh, open data and uh, the issues related to it, but how are you going to establish the quality control required, uh, which requires both discipline on the observational side and assessment of errors, and uh, 
I think there's an open jury about using artificial intelligence with respect to uh, assessing errors. Yeah, uh, great question. So let me say a few things. Uh, where we made grand uh, strides forward is in atmospheric science because of the weather need. That wasn't the scientist, but it was the fact that governments wanted weather forecasts that gave the World Meteorological Organization the power to be a standard-setting body. The WMO can set standards for data and data sets. That really helped to unify the atmospheric science community around weather. We are, don't have quite that same rigor in the ocean yet. The Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission is not a formal standard-setting body. It doesn't have the same mandate. I think that helps. UN bodies, IEEE bodies help with setting standards. That is not what you asked. The next thing, once you have standards, is how do you do the quality control? We have in the ocean community quality control data sets where experts come in and check the data so they are freely available, but they get put into certain archives which have quality controls around them. And I do think that is the way to go. So you are fully open for everything, but then you're going to reduce the gold standard, bronze standard, silver standard, whatever you like, with some checking of the data, of the rigor of the data, of the uncertainty, maybe making sure they're not fake. And I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, artificial intelligence necessarily helps there. There's a little bit of manual uh, labor involved, but best and good practices can we do together, sharing the information. I think for those, AI can help, and AI can really help to make sure that it's consistent. So, but I share with you the concern, this is not gonna go by itself. Just putting everything open will not give you the quality that we want. So there needs to be quality assurance processes behind that. But if you don't have open access, all of these things cannot happen either, right? So there needs to be a good balance of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for uh, an inspiring talk. And uh, as I said at the beginning, these union lectures are always a highlight and you didn't disappoint. Thank you.